Ayr in Lancashire. In local news, the town of Burnley experienced its blackest crime in history, where a three-year-old boy has been done in the most tragic of circumstances, murdered in the darkest of ways. Authorities have the person responsible in custody and will from here on dot most probably ever see the existence of daylight in the remainder of his short-lived life. In other news, Winston Churchill remains confident his research Just three days after Christmas, in December 1909, the lifeless body of a three-year-old boy lay brutalised in a lonely field in the Lancashire town of Burnley, subjected to the most horrific and sadistic attack for no reason at all. Hi folks, and welcome to Dark Fascination where we explore the darker side of life and death. My name's Brian and I'm here today in the beautiful Burnley. And just look at the weather, it's fantastic. And I'm here to tell you the story of how a three-year-old Burnley boy was brutally murdered for no reason at all. So let's do it, folks. Let's get in to today's horrifying and tragic story. Burnley in Lancashire. It has a way of drawing people to the town. Every kind of person has lived or worked in Burnley, which, is, which was initially a small medieval hamlet of farms, with first records of Burnley appearing shortly after the invasion of William the Conqueror in 1066. No little survives of early Burnley, apart from the original Market Cross, which was erected in 1295 and now stands insignificantly in the grounds of Burnley Old Grammar School. And here it is folks, the oldest surviving remnant of Burnley, the original Market Cross. And it sits here, blackened from centuries of weather and industrial chimney smoke. Now this was built at a cost of nine shillings and one penny. And it's literally chucked away in, a, in this tiny, hidden corner of Burnley, just a stone's throw from St Peter's Church down that way. 
Now look at it. The original Market Cross. Now, if you look over here, we have what is known as the Shuri Well. Now, believe it or no, this, what I'm going to show you, was the main source of drinking water for the northern side of Burnley in the 1800s. Now, look at this, guys. Now, look at this. What you see here is but a glimpse of what the grander original well used to look like when it was situated in its original spot just across this road here at the end of a street called Shori Bank and it was positioned right on the banks of the River Brun. Absolutely fascinating. Now, speaking of the River Brun, the River Brun, it runs right through Burnley. And it's believed that this is how the town got its name. Derived originally from Brun Lee, which means meadow by the River Brun. So Brun Lee developed into Burn Lee. Burnley. How fascinating. Absolutely incredible. During the Industrial Revolution, Burnley became one of Lancashire's most prominent mill towns. And at its peak, it was one of the, the world's largest producers of cotton cloth and a major centre of engineering. With the arrival of the Leeds and Liverpool Canal in 1796, this caused a massive influx of goods and people, which massively boosted the town's economy. Dozens of new mills were being thrown up left, right and centre to accommodate the boom in Burnley's society at the time. Now, many foundries and ironworks were built locally and they supplied both the cotton mills and the coal mines around here with the machinery required to function. One of such coal mines was the Bank Hall Colliery. This is Bank Hall Park, the actual site of the former Bank Hall Colliery, which was owned at the time by Hargreaves Colliery Company. Bank Hall was Burnley's largest and deepest coal mine, and it had a lifespan of more than a hundred years. Now this is what remains in memory of the miners and the mining industry that influenced the prosperity of this town. This beautiful memorial, look at that. But there's an obvious lack of any memorial in this area for a tragic event which occurred in 1909. Just three days after Christmas, in the year 1909, on an icy, cold and bitter evening, someone, they led police officers right here, right where Bank Hall Car Park sits today, to discover a tragic and horrendous scene where a three-year-old boy his body lay here, strangled and brutalised, with his throat cut from ear 
to air, lying in a massive pool of his own blood. Now you may ask yourself, who is it that led the police to this scene right here where the crime was committed? Well, it was the very person who committed the gruesome murder. Joseph Wren was born in December of 1880 in Cockermouth, which is in Cumbria, to his mother Mary Ann and his father Isaac. His home life, it was one of hard work, but fairness. He had a loving family, albeit a big one, and there was nothing too traumatic about his childhood when he grew up in the Cumbrian countryside. By 1901, Joseph Wren was 21 years old. He left home to set out on his own. His parents, they remained in Cumbria and they could even afford to have two servants working in their home. Now only families with a sizeable income could afford to have servants at this time. So it seems as though Joseph Wren's family were, were doing okay. Now Joseph, he, he moved to a place called Lorton, which is a parish in the district of Allerdale in Cumbria, where he, where he at the time was a live-in servant. For a, for a family of four. After this, he moved to Dalton in Furness until about 1907, when he decided to join the Nave Docker to heave the coal and throw it into the flaming furnace, in turn providing power to the ship through the steam engines. Stokers were at the bottom of the pile in hierarchy on these vessels and often seen as uneducated and working class by their upper class superiors. They stayed in squalid conditions on board the ship and were paid a pittance for long backbreaking hours of work. Joseph Wren was a stoker when he joined the Navy, working in the mammoth belly of the ship, shovel after shovel in hot, stuffy conditions it was these conditions that led to Joseph Wren having a fit on board the ship and being discharged in 1908. After being discharged from the Navy, Joseph struggled to find any sort of work, spending over a decade just mooching about Burnley and Accrington, and he was unable to even find simple labouring jobs. In March 1909, while Joseph was living in Accrington, he met a young lady from here, from Burnley, a Miss Sarah Ann Calvert, and pretty soon she became pregnant. With, with needing money now, Joseph Wren started to turn to crime. But just two months later, in May, he was convicted of larceny and sentenced to two months in prison. And then later in September of 1909, he was convicted of larceny again and sentenced to three months. During this last sentence, his girlfriend Sarah Ann Calvert, she had the baby. Joseph Wren would be released the following month with no work, no money and no prospects, Joseph Wren couldn't support his newborn child. His depression deepened, so he decided to buy some laudanum. Laudanum was a popular drug in the Victorian period. It was widely used to treat everything from pain, insomnia, and even female disorders. 
and it was even used to quiet crying babies. But too much would result in certain death. Joseph tried to persuade Sarah, his girlfriend, to take some of the laudanum. But Sarah didn't do it, so he took some himself, but with no serious result, unfortunately. So it all became too much for Sarah. So eventually she put a stop to any contact with Joseph, even preventing him seeing his own child. Joseph Wren's darkest days had just become even darker. Early Industrial Burnley was a thriving mill town, with one of its most prominent industrial locations based right alongside the Leeds and Liverpool Canal, in two distinct areas called Scartop and Hilltop. Many Burnley folk today may not have even heard of these two areas, but in the past they both contained heavy industry and housing for the hard-working people of Burnley. Scartop Mill was positioned just south of Adlington Street, covering the area between Church Street and the Leeds and Liverpool Canal. Positioned on the land right next to where TK Max is located, right behind the Sion Baptist Church, which still stands today. Sandwiched between long forgotten streets, such as Wellhouse Street, Engine Street and Malt Kiln Street. One such Burnley family who lived on Malt Kiln Street was the Collins family. Sarah and William Collins lived at number 9 Malt Kiln Street with their infant daughter Ellen and their three-year-old son John. Malt Kiln Street stood right at the back of Scar Top Mill, a typical mill worker street, house after house of dilapidated one-up, one-down, back-to-back properties, all crammed in as close to the neighbouring mill as possible. Squalid and unkempt, these were no place of luxury just a simple dwelling. I'm stood in the car park of the Sion Baptist Church, situated on Church Street, just behind, right the, behind the building there. That's Church Street. Uh, if you're from Burnley, you know this area. There's TK Max down here, um, just in the distance. Now, just along here, running up here, would have been a street called Engine Street and it would have been situated right here. And it would have looked onto the side of uh, the scar top mill that's sadly all demolished now and that would have been in the distance. Now let's take a look at a side-by-side -side comparison map of how this area once looked and you'll see Engine Street right here. The map on the left is how it used to be and the map on the right is how it is now. If we look at the map on the right, this is Sion Baptist Church. I'm here in the car park, right on the land where Engine Street once was located. If you look over to the map on the left, this is Engine Street. Sarah and William Collins lived here on Malt Kiln Street at number 9. This street used to run right where the car park is located here today. So I'm up on the bank next to the canal, the Leeds and Liverpool Canal, and you can see the Sion Baptist Church over there in the distance. And over here is where Scartop Mill was once located. Now Sarah, William and their children, they lived along here on Malt Kiln Street, just right where this car park is. And they lived there in 1909, when little John was just three 
years old. Sarah, she worked in this mill. At Scartop Mill is a cotton winder. In the mill, it literally just towered the land right here. She would have had to walk along Engine Street over there and then onto Wellhouse Street to reach Adlington Street up at the top and that's where the entrance of the mill was located. Now William, her husband, he worked over on the Bank Hall Colliery, digging up coal in the mines, hauling up the very fuel that Joseph Wren could have shoveled into the dreadnought furnaces when he was in the Navy. At 5.30 p.m. on December the 28th in 1909, William Collins, he allowed three-year-old John to go and wait at the end of Engine Street to meet his mother Sarah as she finished work at the mill. Just 10 minutes later, at around 5.40 p.m., Sarah arrived home to number nine Malt Kiln Street alone. Walking in the door, unaware that John should have been there waiting for her, her arrival. She inquired to her husband about John's whereabouts. Just, where's John? And with panic, he told Sarah, I sent him to come and meet you. But she hadn't seen him on her short walk home. So Sarah and William frantically searched this whole area, all the inner and surrounding streets, shouting for their child. Echoes of John's name was bellowing throughout the narrow streets that surrounded the mill, but to no avail. They couldn't find John. The three-year-old boy, he was out, he was alone and he was missing. The only reported sighting of little John Collins at Collins after this point was from a weaver from the Scartop Mill, a Mr Barker, who had seen John Collins on Queen Victoria Road near the Bank Hall Colliery shortly after 5.30 p.m and he was being carried by a stranger. That very same evening, 28-year-old Joseph Wren nonchalantly walked into the Burnley Police Station right here on Parker Lane. Approaching the desk, he was met by Sergeant Appleby and without hesitation, he calmly told him, I've just murdered a young boy. I don't know why I did it. Stunned, the policeman pressed Joseph for more information, but Joseph, he felt in complete control and responding back to the officers, he said, wait a minute, give me a drink and a cigarette and I will tell you all about it. The officers, of course, obliged his wishes and provided Joseph Wren with a cigarette and a drink of water and with confidence Joseph Wren gave the following statement I am a sailor about quarter to six I met a young boy near to Queen's Park I got hold of him and I carried him to the sidings at Bank Hall I then strangled him with my hands and I cut his throat with my knife there's a piece of the handle cut out of it I waited there for a minute or two to see if he were dead. Then I cut his throat again. I wiped my hands on my handkerchief. You'll find it there. I don't know what made me do it. 
and I don't want to say anything more just yet. Joseph Wren, he led the police back here, right to the scene of the crime, right where they found little John's lifeless body. And it was on based where this car park is today, Bank Hall Car Park. Now right beside the body was the blood soaked knife used in the attack. And lying just a little further away was the handkerchief that was found was also covered in blood. Little John's neck had been cut so badly the windpipe was completely severed with the laceration so deep it reached the spinal column. Showing the attack was undertook with extreme ferocity. There was also multiple bruises around little John's neck where Joseph had attempted to strangle him. A complete sadistic act against an innocent little boy. Joseph Wren was arrested on the spot and how the officers refrained from brutally returning the favour to Joseph Wren I will never understand. Police, they then delivered the devastating news to little John's parents back at Malt Kiln Street and their world obviously collapsed, learning how their poor little son met the most horrendous end. Joseph Wren he appeared at court after the new year in January 2010, making no response when the charges of willful murder were being read to him. His defence counsel pleaded insanity on Joseph Wren's behalf, using his lack of work and the situation with his girlfriend and not seeing his child as the excuse for why he did what he did. William Collins, Little John's father, he gave evidence and he told the court that he actually recognised Joseph Wren from in and around Burnley. Just a passing face and that they had no grievances or no reason that could have caused this horrendous crime. Joseph Wren eventually started to plead his case and in court he made a statement and he said I left Acklington about three o'clock. It was raining hard when I got to Burnley. I went down to Church Street and there I met my brother. He asked me where I was going and I said, I did not know. I was so depressed at the time. I didn't know what I was doing. I had not had any food for three days and I knew that I was going weak minded. After I had left my brother, I saw this child. I took it at place mentioned and strangled it. Then I cut its throat with a knife. After I'd done that, I went back to the body three or four times and felt it. I knew then it were dead. I then got onto Queen Victoria Road and I got quietly away. A man came running after me and I thought he'd seen me doing this, but he simply asked me for a match and he ran on again. I then went up to Higgins Street and waited for the opportunity to see my own child, but could not see it. Through family troubles, I really intended to make a way with my child and not the one I have done. I knew that it was impossible to get work and marry my girlfriend and my mind unhinged and bad thoughts were within me. 
If I'd seen my child and in my then condition, I would have undoubtedly taken its life. I fully understand the predicament my girlfriend was in and to save her from disgrace, I would have done anything. Though I, really, I think I was not in my right senses. I am now and I'm fully sorry for what I've done and I hope that I shall be forgiven by the child's parents. I know the penalty is now and I'm fully prepared for it. Joseph Wren started to show complete remorse for his actions, even pleading to little John's family for forgiveness. Was this a deviating plan of Joseph Wren's to try and escape the ultimate punishment for his crime? It seemed that everybody who knew Joseph Wren started to support his claim of insanity. Sarah Ann Calvert, Joseph Wren's former girlfriend, she stated that Joseph was frequently depressed. He suffered fits that lasted 15 to 20 minutes and had previously left a suicide note in her house. Jo Joseph Wren's sister, Elizabeth, and his brother, Ernest, they also provided statements. Ernest mentioned his brother's first fit, that one that got him discharged from the Navy. Whilst Elizabeth argued that her aunt had been committed to an asylum, suggesting that insanity it ran in the family. But thankfully their efforts were wasted. The 12 men and, the, and women in the jury, they didn't hesitate and within 45 minutes they returned a verdict of guilty. The judge, he then donned the black, ha the black cap and condemned Joseph Wren to death. Joseph, he said nothing. The Home Office had a brand new Home Secretary, 35-year-old Winston Churchill, one of Britain's most poignant leaders of all time. His very first death warrant that he signed was that of Joseph Wren. After he signed it, the following day Joseph Wren was led from his cell in Strange Ways Prison by Henry Pierpoint, Albert Pierpoint's father, to be hanged. Incidentally, Joseph Wren had already tried to hang himself in his cell, but it was prevented by a quick-thinking prison warder. So a large crowd had gathered outside of the prison, awaiting the death notice to be posted and to hear the prison bell. That would confirm that horrible excuse of a human no longer existed. And two minutes after leaving his cell, the deed was done. The bell rang and the notice was posted. The execution brought an end to one of the most shocking crimes in Burnley's history.
Little John Collins got laid to rest right here in an unmarked grave. Whether it was lack of money or to prevent people from finding it easily, there is no memorial or headstone. It's a shame. A Miss Anne Collins purchased a plot right here guys, right where this, can you see this urn, this plot here. Um, and I'm, I'm unsure exactly who she is, she's obviously related to the family. But on the 1st of January in 1910, three-year-old three John Collins was buried right here. Sarah Collins, little John's mum, she bought the plot right next to where John was buried, right here. And both her and William are buried right here, right beside their beloved son, John. And now they will be finally reunited as a family. And I hope they're all resting in peace together. So there you have it folks, I've said this before, but this is truly one of the most shocking cases I've ever read. How one twisted man could go so far and how he could afflict so much pain and atrocity onto such a little child. It's beyond words. This truly is one of Burnley's most shocking crimes in history. A tragic story of how an innocent little boy was taken and brutally murdered for no reason at all. Absolutely insane. So thanks so much guys. I really do appreciate you tuning in. It means a lot. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this story. And if you're from Burnley, have you heard this story before? Let me know in the comments. And if you found this story as fascinating as, as I did, then feel free to hit the thumbs up to let me know. So that's it, folks. Until next time, you all take care and all the best.